Okay, well, welcome. Now, tonight we are obviously talking about planning. And planning is interesting. I've got a fair bit to say about planning, um, and some of it's conflicting. Obviously, having a plan is a great idea, but a plan in itself doesn't always solve all our problems. Uh, but tonight, hopefully, I'm going to share with you a framework which we've found to be pretty successful for us and for our, our clients. And the idea is that you'll probably see some things you like, some things you don't, and that's fine. Pick and choose and, and find out what works for you. Now, I do have uh, a workbook for you tonight, which we're going to sort of work our way through. But the workbook is kind of intended to be a takeaway tool and it's obviously downloadable from, from the website so you can get one every time you need to create a plan. But I'll hand them out in a little while so we don't get too distracted. The key things that we're going to go through are um, talking about a vision and why it's important to have one and how you might create a vision. Taking your vision and building, uh, breaking it down a stepping stone into goals and then formulating our sort of, one of our centerpiece tools in keeping clients focused and on track, the 90 day plan. And then we're gonna talk about, well, how, once you've got a plan, how do you maintain momentum on it? You know, you, sometimes you get that plan, it's all exciting, you're like, woohoo, I've got a plan. And then reality kicks in and all of a sudden the phone starts ringing and people say, can you do this, can you do that? And you think, oh, there's a good idea. And next thing you know, the plan sort of gets dusty on the side. So we're gonna give you some tips and tricks on, on how to stay on track. But sort of looking at the, the big picture, if we were to break it down into sections, we've got the real long-term vision, which is, you know, pick a time frame. it doesn't really matter. Fifth, I've got 10 to 15 years here, but it could be 20 years. Um, but then you wanna break it down into, you know, more tangible or concrete goals, because sometimes the really long-term goals are hard to sort of formulate and see. They're a bit, they're a bit far away to sort of touch. So then we break it down to three to five year goals, which are sort of things you can stay kind of more present around and you can get a little more tangible. But then we wanna go one step further and get really clear on, on some one year goals, because one year goals, and I'm gonna give you some guidelines on setting these goals, can be quite specific. But sometimes it's hard to stay focused in the day to day, hard to stay focused on one year goals even, and sit there and, and deal with your email and the short term priorities that are in front of you, which is why we break it down even further to a 90 day plan. So it's kind of, that's the framework we're gonna follow is these sort of stepping stones. But we're gonna start on the, the longer term vision. And like I said, it, it doesn't have to be 10 or 15 years. I just put that out there because it sort of helped us understand that we want it to be a fair way in the future. So a vision, well, what's a vision? Anyone wanna have a crack at what, what would you think a vision might be? A dream. What was that, Harry? A dream. A dream, it could be a dream, absolutely. What else? You had one more? An idea? Yeah, it's sort of, it's a, I think about it as a picture in our mind, right? A vision is a picture in our mind, something that we can see that's usually obviously, well, in this context, it's, it's in the future. And it can be a challenging thing to do. I don't know if you guys have thought about a vision and what the vision is for your life and for your business, but to be able to slowly and gradually see it clearer and clearer can help you in a couple of ways. If you think about a building, right, before a building or before actually anything can be made, someone has seen it in their mind, right? A builder doesn't, just doesn't grab a couple of bricks and you know a few uh, pieces of lumber, throw them together and go, oh wow, look at that. Like it started with an image before anything was, anything was touched or anything was lifted. There was a clear image of what this thing needed to look like when it was done. And why that's good for a building is because you can start to see if things are not going right, or you can start to see if we're on track, you've got something to reference and some guide. If someone says, hey, do you want some of these, uh, some of these pink tiles? You can look at the picture and go, you know what? Those pink tiles are not a fit for what we're doing, but thanks anyway. But sometimes in business, if we're not clear on our vision, someone says, do you want the pink tiles, which might be a business opportunity, might be a new product line, it might be something else. If we haven't got something to gauge us to say, okay, is this taking us where we want to take us? Then it can easy, be easy to get sidetracked by these, these ideas. And, and entrepreneurs and business owners are infamous for getting sidetracked by new ideas and things that are exciting. So, and that's fine, that's great. It's, it's good to have the ideas, but sometimes we need a filtering system. And that's part of what our vision can be. The other good thing about a vision is it's your chance to become very intentional about where you're going and what you're trying to create. 
Um, you know, I know I have come across people in this world who have amazing lives and had no vision whatsoever, right? They just stumbled their way through and all of a sudden they've got exactly what they wanted. I don't know how that works. Um, so I'm, there are many ways down this path, but the path that I've seen to be more successful is to be clearer on where we want to go. It's like if you're going on a, on a holiday, you wouldn't just start driving down the road. You'd probably pre-think where you want to go and what you want to do. And you have an idea of what you want it to look like before you start booking tickets and driving down the road. And that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. So the clearer you can see your vision, the easier it is to make it happen. Um, and investing time is critical. So it can be easy just to keep going, right? Every day, a new day comes and things come at you and you just put one foot in front of the other. Taking the time to sit and think about, you know, the vision of what you want to create, it does take time. And it has to be a force and intentional interrupt to your normal thinking time. So we're going to talk about how to create that. And the last one is you want to invest time in visualizing. So like an athlete who might have a goal of you know, winning a gold medal in some event, let's say it's a swimmer, right? They get taught by their sports psychologist to invest time in visualizing themselves winning and in visualizing themselves um, swimming their record time. Like what does it feel like? What is the sensations they're experiencing? And so it is with the vision we've got for our business or our life the more we can see it in our mind and feel it and experience it, the more real it is to us. It's not some grandiose idea that's sort of, oh, it's just out there maybe one day, but when you sit and you, you feel it and you start to feel it in your nervous system, then it becomes inevitable. It starts to become more inevitable that it's gonna happen because you can see it. You're like, I can see it. I know it's gonna happen. I know I, I can do it. So believability starts to kick in rather than it just being sort of some pipe dream out there. You know, sometimes we can be sort of flippant and say, yeah, I'd love to have that, or I'd love to do this, or I'd love my business to be this. And they're kind of these flippant comments that come out there. But, the, you know, there's many case studies of people that have created amazing things, and when you ask them how they did it, there's no surprise in them. They just, they just knew it was going to happen because it was a vision they could see. You know, Steve Jobs is a, is a great example of that. He just had these visions that people, other people just couldn't see, but he could see it. And through his conviction around what he could see, he could convince others that this was an inevitability. And so he created so many amazing things because he just believed in them so strongly. And that's, that's part of what we have to do because building a business, you know, sometimes you do have to convince people of things that might seem crazy. And everyone can look at you and say, why the heck are you doing that? That makes no sense at all. And if you're not sure, if you can't see this thing and it's not meaningful to you, it's easy to get shaken off your off your, off your path, or you can talk yourself out of it, or allow other people to talk you out of it, because you think, yeah, that that's probably is crazy, why am I doing that? But the clearer we are, and the more centered we are and grounded in that vision, the, the more powerful it's gonna be for us. So I might just hand out this workbook, because, can I get you to take a couple of those and pass them around? Lou, can you do the same? I'll just leave them there in case we need more. <laughs> now you might go to the stage of creating a vision board. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these or heard of this idea. So a vision board becomes a, you know, a tangible visual representation of what you're trying to create. And this can be in context of your business or in context of your life. But one of the advantages of a tool like this is, you know, I mentioned before the visualization part, and you know, it's not easy to sit down every day or once a week or once a month and sit down and visualize this thing. So having something visual that's right there in front of us can just be a reminder for us. So that, that's why we're doing this. That's what we're working towards. That little reminder every day. Uh, or if you're more of a, a written sort of person, that one's not super clear, but you can, you know, just different, that one's just got different areas of someone's life and all the different things that they're looking to create in that area of their life. So it's just a way of sort of brainstorming, you know, this is what I want my life to look like, or this is what I want my business to look like. Now there's two, yeah, I mentioned life and, and business, and obviously a vision, the common factor in your vision is you. So, you know, you can separate it out. You can say, this is my business vision, or this is my personal life vision. There's, there's no hard rules on, on how you do it. 
but you've got business vision, personal vision, it might be one combined thing. The other element to this that is important to think about and, and can be challenging uh, is, is your purpose. And what is your purpose? So purpose is, I would define as the reason why you are doing something, which is sort of a you know, pretty simple definition of purpose. But you know, if you've got this vision for creating this great business, then you've got to ask yourself the question, why? why? Why am I doing that? What is the purpose behind all this? And there's a concept called the law of precession, which is, um, it actually comes from physics. And the law of precession is, pilots know this very well. So if you've got a propeller spinning, like a, a pilot or a mechanic or whoever designed the engine wants the propeller to spin around, so it can push a, a plane forward. Well, that, and it wants it to spin as fast as possible. That's the rotation they want. But what actually happens when you spin something really fast, there's another force that happens on one side of a propeller. I don't know if, don't know if you've ever held, uh, you get those helicopters with the, uh, the propellers that can come off, or you've seen something like a little propeller spin up in the air, it actually lifts up on one side more than the other. So in a helicopter, if you have the propeller spinning really fast in the horizontal direction, it will naturally lift one way. And they have to design a, a helicopter a certain way to counterbalance that lift that happens. Where I'm going with this is that the law of precession states that a body in motion affects other things in motion. And there's often a force at 90 degree to the force that we exert. And what can happen sometimes in this example, the bee is after the pollen because it has got to make honey. It thinks its job is to make honey. Many business owners think their job is to make money, right? Honey money. But what is often true is there's an other purpose to that business. That business is serving another purpose apart from just going after the money. The bee's true purpose is pollination and, and you know, spreading the pollen amongst plants that gives us life, right? But the bee doesn't know that. The bee is just going after the honey. And so the purpose, when we can tap into it and know what it is we're really doing, it has way more power to our efforts and our focus and what we're doing than just going after a goal that might be you know, beneficial to yourself, which is sometimes what a lot of a vision can be. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But knowing that most of the time, a purpose is driven around creating value for others. And when that's part of our driving force, it has an exponential effect on the effort that you put out there. Why this is important, well, a couple of things, and I've got a couple of slides I'm going to walk you through, but I mentioned this to you at the start, was that a business can be hard. There can be a lot of work to put in to get a business going. And you've all experienced this, right? Businesses can be really tough. It's not an easy and smooth path. And if you don't have the emotional fuel to push through those tough times, then it can be easy to give up. But when you're clearer on these things here, you know what you're going after and it's meaningful to you and you understand the purpose behind what you're doing, that can give you emotional fuel to push through those tough times. It's not a panacea, it's not a silver bullet, but it's, it, it definitely helps. Otherwise, the effort and the journey can be a little bit hollow. So on your workbook there, take a look at page, I think it's page four and five. Page four and five. I've got some questions there. So the bottom of page four talks about purpose finding questions and some lifestyle, lifestyle defining questions, which is sort of geared around you know, a personal vision. And on page six, there are some business defining questions which might help craft a bit of a vision around your business. So I'm going to give you a few moments now, not to answer all those, like there's, there's a lot of thought that can be required in that, but I want you to glance through those and pick one or two that kind of stand out and you think you might have some ideas around and just jot, jot down a couple, of, a couple of bullet points. Okay, maybe you got the sense that you can spend a bit of time looking and pondering these questions. They're not, uh, they're not sort of quick, short, one word uh, answers. But I highly encourage you to invest the time in doing it. Um, it can be quite enlightening to sort of explore where your mind takes you to consider some of these things. And you know, as you can see, there's no right or wrong answers to anything. It's all very, very individual. 
But doing that kind of deep thinking and deep work, even if you can't find the right answers initially, you come back to it, come back to it, and you're planting seeds in your mind. And they'll, they'll grow, like things will come to you. You'll hear things because you, you know, you know, once you've read the question, you'll start to see things that resonate or start to mean, mean something more to you. Um, and you, you know, questions like, you know, if my mission was to impact a billion people, how would I do it? Well, that may not be your mission to impact a billion people, but it gets your mind thinking in a certain way. And I think one of the benefits of thinking this way is it can force us to think a little bigger. And I think the world needs more entrepreneurs who think a little bigger because we're very fortunate in this room that we have the ability to create these businesses that can have an impact on people and can create change. We're not stuck in a, in a box. We, we have no, no boundaries in what we do. And so to be able to think much broader and bigger enables us to have a pretty huge impact. Um, and then, you know, if you do that, you look at some of the other questions like how much money do I want to make? What does my investment portfolio look like? It makes those things a lot easier too because the, the law of procession says you go after and you have a big impact. If you do it smart, you make a lot of money. So, you know, it all, it all works together. Um, but of course, it's an individual thing. There's no, there's no rules around it. You don't have to do anything at any certain scale. It's all very individual. So why, is all, why does this stuff matter uh, about having a vision? I mean, I spoke a bit about it already, but you know, the goals, why is that important? And a couple of additional points to make around that. There's a, a formula that we teach called the formula for life success. And it goes like this. It says B times do equals have where have is the results and goals, do is the actions, and the B is the thinking or the person. And right now, if you look at the results you've got in any area of your life, they're a function of the things that you've done and a function of who you are. That's, that's the formula. And so if you can look at it in a historical sense, but you can also cast it forward and say, okay, what do I wanna, what do I wanna have in the future? And that then dictates what you have to do and who you need to be. And the bigger you make those goals, the bigger you make the have, the more you have to become. You have to become better. You have to become more capable to be able to do those things. And my personal belief is that that's, that's the journey. That's the, that's the goal. And so the goal is a pulling mechanism. You know, the bigger the goal, it pulls you towards something and it puts pressure on you to, to create more and become more as an individual. You know, to, be, to build a business of a certain scale or a certain size, you need certain skills. You've got to be able to think a certain way. And you know, there's no right or wrong size to be at, but you know, we, the, another law that co coincides with this is um, the law of perturbation that says that something is either growing or the second law of thermonuclear physics is that something's either growing or dying. And for something to grow requires time and pressure. And so having a big goal is a form of pressure because if we're not growing as individuals, then we're dying. There's no staying the same. Right? Nature doesn't work that way. A tree is either growing or dying, and humans are exactly the same. So I think having the big goals helps us to stretch ourselves and think differently. And big goals doesn't necessarily mean having to work harder. Right? Sometimes the hardest work is in the thinking. Like sitting and pondering these questions and thinking deeply about them, that's hard work. It's not out there you know, shoveling you know, a ton of gravel. That's hard work too. But doing the thinking, it's easy not to do. It's easy not to do but it has a big payoff. The other reason why it's important is there's a part of your brain called your RAS, or your reticular activating system. Has anyone heard of the reticular activating system? Maybe I just made it up. I don't know. <laughs> now, reticular activating system is a filtering mechanism. So we, we get bombarded with thousands and thousands of bits of information every day, but we only consciously notice a very small part of what comes at us. Like if I could ask you on your drive here, what did all the road signs say? And you probably can't tell me. Maybe some of you can, maybe you noticed that stuff, maybe it was on your mind. But you probably had the experience where you had just bought a new car or new car to you, or you were looking to get one, and you started seeing that car everywhere on the road. Right? It's because that idea is planted in your mind and so you notice those things. That, those cars were always there. They just didn't all of a sudden appear more, but you're noticing them. And so it happens when you have a vision and goals and it's planted in your mind, you start noticing things that can help you create it. And you, start to, start, and you can act on those things. Right? They just start to show up for you. They're always there, but you don't notice them if you've got no filter 
to be able to you know, point things out. You just become sort of benign to the world around you. So that, that's a really important concept. And you can use this on a macro scale or a micro scale. You can use it on a daily scale. You can say today, it's really important, like getting really focused around the goal for the day. And you'd be surprised at how, how little things come to you that can help you achieve that. And it, most of it's because of this, the reticular activating system, just setting, setting your radar intentionally on what you need to notice. Okay, let's get into some goal setting. So I'm gonna give you nine rules. Well, let's call them guidelines. I don't like rules, um, but I've called them rules. So <laughs> call them whatever you like. Um, but these are guidelines which I think are, are, are handy to make your goals effective. So number one is you gotta make sure they're yours. Um, like I said with these questions here, right? there's no right answers, it's a very individual thing. Uh, which might sound obvious, but we get conditioned in life to think a certain way by what's around us. That's just part of being human. And sometimes it's really easy to find yourself going down a path that really isn't your path. You find out you're doing it on other people's expectations or what your friends think or, you know, wh whatever it might be. So just getting really clear that the goals that you're working towards are ones that really matter to you. Uh, might be your business partner's goals, might be your spouse's goals. Right, but you gotta make sure you, you got, got your own goals, which goes hand in hand with they have gotta be meaningful. Right, so what I mean by that is like the purpose thing, they gotta sort of provide you some juice. Like they, you've gotta care about achieving them or not. If it's kind of ah, uh, whatever, then they're not gonna be that effective for you. Specific and measurable. Uh, so there's a thing called SMART goals. Has anyone heard of SMART goals, which is kind of a subsection of what I'm going through here? SMART goals? Yes, uh, awesome. All right, Reza, what's, what does SMART goal stand for? Specific, measurable, so I've got those two up there. Measure, is there an E in that? Don't know. Measurable, what's the A? Achievable. Achievable. R, realistic. Time frame. So this is a you know another I guess these are the five rules <laughs> of setting goals, but it's a simpler version of what I'm going through here. Um, just you know sometimes people set goals like I'd like to make more money, I'd like to increase my revenue, or I'd like to have more free time. And if you put it up against these, you'll see that it's, it's very unspecific. It's not measurable. There's no time frame to it, so it's probably never going to happen because you've got no pressure around it. So like the meaningful, it's got to sort of make you jump out of bed in the morning. It's got to feel challenging. It's got to sort of make you a little bit nervous. Um, a goal that doesn't give a little bit of excitement or a little bit of fear around it doesn't have the emotion around it that's going to help fuel you. Align with your values. That's probably similar to the making sure it's yours. So we all have certain values that drive us and are most meaningful to us. And so we want to act in alignment with those. When we're out of that, we don't feel good about what we're doing. We feel soulless uh, in, our, in our efforts. So just begin clearing your values and making sure it's aligned and obviously your vision as well. Balanced. So a, one of my best friends, uh, his dad was a, a sports psychologist at the AIS. And one day I was talking to him and I was trying to get some contacts through gymnastics to try and pull some strings on some stuff. But we just got to talking and he was talking, some, sharing some stories about some of the athletes he's worked with who you could argue extremely goal focused and have a very strong vision. But the amount of mental and emotional health that he had to deal with because they were so fixated on their goal and sacrificed everything in the name of the goal. Uh, I think this one's really important. It's probably more, we're more aware of it these days. We don't just live to work. I mean, you know, I'm here talking about business all the time, but business is by no means the number one thing in my life. But, you know, you've got to make sure you're balanced on what you do. So realistic, that's this one here. My spin on this is I think every goal is realistic, but you've got to adjust it with a time frame sometimes. You know, if you say, okay, we want to create the biggest biodynamic farm in Australia, and yes, it's going to be a one year goal, right? You might not be falling into the realistic time frame, but if you're going to make that a 15 year goal, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, who knows what you could do. Um, giving back, I think this is an important part, is part of that, you know, part of the purpose thing, making sure that you're, you're helping others and serving others in, in the work that you do. You know, what you put out comes back. 
and supported. So this is an interesting one. Supported meaning you've got people supporting you. Now, you've, I think you've got to be careful on who you choose to get support you because there's more naysayers in the world than there are, yeah, go get them people. Uh, and hopefully you've got some go get them people in your circle and they're the people to share with, the ones that are going to, you know, help you believe that you can do something and, and help you when you're down around it, you know, give you that little, that little push and a little supportive word rather than those they are going to uh, talk your idea down. Some people use support as a point of accountability, right? Share it with someone. Uh, you know, it depends on your personality style. Some people like to share it with people who are naysayers so they can poo-poo and then show them that they get it done. That, that's what drives them is the, you know, you just watch, right? See what I can do. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, know who, who and how you need, know how you need to share it and, and with who. Okay, coming back to goals. So you started to, started to um, craft out, you know, some of those answers around a longer term vision. Now I'm going to give you a few minutes to to articulate some three to five year goals and then some one year goals. So again, you can reference some of those questions that are there and give them a tighter time frame, but you're really coming back to these nine rules to think about what do I want to, what are some more tangible things that I can itemize as three to five year goals and or, or just the one year goals, whatever you like. We're gonna work f further on the one year goals. So definitely make sure you get one of those down. Um, and like tonight, we're not gonna create the perfect plan tonight. I just want you to, to get a taste of doing some of these things. So we're sort of breaking the ice if this concept is new to you. And just, you know, so you can get a start if it's not. So three to five year goals and one year goals. So you want at least one one-year goal. Yeah, if you want it to be a 15-month goal, that's fine. To line up within the next financial year. Okay, you guys need a minute. Can we wrap it up? Everyone got one down? Everyone got a goal down? Yep. And obviously, you can work more on this when you get home tonight. Eh? <laughs> okay, so we've got a goal. Um, so now what we're going to do is brainstorm out. So take your one year goal and a bit of a brainstorming exercise at a high level, what are all the possible things that you might look to do um, to achieve that goal. So when I say high level, what I mean by that, and don't get too caught up if it's, you know, if you're down the detail, but you know, you might say, I need to run an email marketing program, or the higher level of that might be, I need to do a better job of communicating with, with customers or with prospects, because there could be different ways you do that. Do you know what I mean? So just sort of keeping it one step up perhaps. But don't, you know, don't worry too much right now. Just get ideas down. Like take, pick one of your goals, pick one of your goals and just start brainstorming different ideas of things that you can do to make that goal happen. But it's okay to say things that are a bit unspecific. Like you might say we need to do yeah, a better job of marketing. That's fine. Because um, we're going to get down to the detail later on. You might say, okay, we need to be, be able to improve our margins or we need to hire more people. You know, it's okay to have those higher level things that are a bit unspecific, because you're gonna get down a bit more detail in a second. So as you look at those, if you did write down some three to five year goals, you just wanna check your ideas and make sure they align with those longer term goals as well. Because sometimes there could be a path to short term win that it's sort of going to sabotage you down the track. Not often, but sometimes. Just, just a quick check. Make sure that those ideas still align. And then what you're going to do is on your list, you're going to look for the top three to five things on your list. And you, know, you might not you might only have three to five now, but ideally you get a long list of different things that you could, that you could potentially do. And you circle the top three to five that just form the key priorities that are going to form the focus of what you're doing. 
what we're trying to do is, is narrow our focus to be able to achieve the specific goals that we're after. When we're trying to focus on too many things, our brains are not as effective. But when we can focus on, on less things, it's, it's easier to sort of, um, you know, stay focused on what we're trying to achieve. So that's, that's the goal here. I probably should put a caveat in here to say that in what I've seen over and over again, that planning and doing this sort of work is a skill set and it takes practice. So, you know, if you are practiced at this right now and you're flying through it, awesome. If you haven't done a whole lot of this stuff, it might be really hard and that's okay because it does take time to get good at it. Most people, most time I see someone's first 90 day plan, they rarely do well against it because they load it up with so much stuff and they, they just, you know, they, they just get too optimistic. Um, and that's fine, but next time they, they correct and they do it differently. So take a look at your thing and if you've, got, if you've got a few on there, or even if you can't do three to five, if you've got one on there, you know that is definitely a key driver for me to achieve this goal. Just circle it, just circle it. Because where we're going with the 90 day plan is to get down to, to bite sized chunks that we can action. Uh, one of the reasons we don't act on things is because we're not clear. Uh, we're not 100% sure on, on what we have to do. And probably I would say that one of the major benefits of the planning process is just getting that sense of clarity. Because the, the reality is that when you come to execute, plans rarely go according to plan, right? You, you often, it often never works out the way you think it's gonna work out. But when you've done the, the thinking and the planning, when you start to get off track or a curveball comes your way, you're prepared for it because you've done the thinking. You know, you know the what if scenarios and thinking through and you understand the consequences of getting off track and you can take the appropriate action. But when you haven't done the deep thinking, then you know, curveballs can just completely derail you or new ideas pop up I and mean, that sounds good and off you go down, down the rabbit hole. So, which comes to a question of timing, like I believe that every 90 days you should be investing half a day to a full day in planning your business. That's out of the business, no phones, completely, completely present to go through this process and develop a 90 day plan. Um, times when I know I've rushed through it and just sort of written something down, the quarter's always been wishy-washy, but when I, when I invest the time, and I see this, this with clients all the time, when they've got a really clear, well thought out plan, the execution is way better than when they're just sort of thrown together. I reckon we should do these three things in the quarter. Okay, good, let's go. So bite-sized chunks. So a couple of key questions. Um, for us to be on track, what are the milestones, mini goals, or strategic priorities that need to be achieved in the next 90 days? So a few different words there I've got mini goals, strategic priorities. What I'm trying to get to is what are, the, what are the few things that we need to focus on in the next 90 days? And that might be a goal. Like if your goal is to, you know, come back to the financial to make a certain amount of money, maybe a mini goal of that is, we know the first is we need to get our margins up by 10%, right? Maybe that's the first mini goal that leads to the longer goal. Or your longer goal might be, uh, okay, we need to increase our customer base by, by 50%. So the priority this quarter is just going to be to get our marketing plan organized, right? That's not really a goal, but it's a, just a, a strategy. And I don't want to get hung up on semantics, um, but we might a little bit. <laughs> so you want, in the, next, in the next 90 days, you want it to be one to five things that you're focused on. And ideally one, but you know, it's rarely one. I, I think three is like a nice number. Again, we're trying to narrow our focus. And think about it this way, like it's only 90 days, right? It's only three months. And you still, we're talking about things in that 90 days on this plan that are proactive, things that are improving our business. We're not talking about things just doing the business. Like this is the work on the business versus work in the business. And if you do three things really well in a quarter to improve your business, and you do that four quarters in a row, you'll have a much better business at the end of the year than if you try and do 20 things in the first quarter and get none of them done, just roll them over the next quarter and then the next quarter and you still finish the year not really completing anything. So we want to avoid that trap, like smaller amount of things. That's why I think it's okay to have one thing. If you pick one thing, but it's the right thing, you're going to be way better off than sort of a haphazard five things that, um, that you're trying to work on. So what are the one to five things? Less is better. I've covered that off. Um, now, before I go too far, in the 90-day planning process, if you turn on your 
your workbooks to page eight and nine. For those who are at the first session where we covered profit model and cash flow, this will be somewhat familiar. It's a bit small in the copy, but we've basically got there a income statement and a balance sheet. So don't get too freaked out by that, <laughs> but we want to start by putting his, some historicals in there so we can see what we've done in the past. And then we want to start forecasting. So page eight is the historicals and page nine is the forecast. We always want to make sure we're looking at financials when we're planning. Right, because often our plan won't necessarily, like if we're doing things around team or around systems or, you know, maybe even around marketing, it can be easy to forget about the numbers, right? So even if you're not going to have a financial goal that you're working towards, doing this is critical. It's just a, a discipline to make sure you're staying on top of the numbers. Regardless of how complicated or uh, simple your numbers are, you always just want to know where you're at. Um, so that, that's a key one. I just want to throw that one in there. So um, back to semantics. <laughs> what is a goal and what is a strategy? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter, but I'm just going to give you my definition uh, because I find it helpful to think about it, and I've found other clients find it helpful as well. So a goal is generally a result, right? Something that you are trying to achieve, whereas a strategy is a set of actions that would help you to attain. And the reason I, I like to make this definition is because I think goals are really important to identify because they're the end result. There might be many strategies behind a goal, but sometimes we can get caught up in just strategies and strategies and tactics. And if we go there first and we just start thinking about strategies, we're not always thinking of them in context of the end game that we're trying to, we're trying to achieve. So we want to start with goals. Now, I'm jumping around a little bit because I've asked you to think about some, some longer term goals and then some strategic priorities and now I started talking about 90 day plans and we're going to get down to the detail of your 90 day plan. Before I do, I want to give you an overview of the four key model we use for growing businesses because it's probably what you're going to draw from when you build your 90 day plan. You know, when you think about what you need to be doing in your business in the next 90 days, it's probably going to be one of these key areas. Uh, and if you've read the book, then I, this will be a, a revision for you. So we know there's four key areas in a business that we have got to focus on. There's the money, there's the growth, there's operations, and there's team. Um, and we break it down very simply. They're trying to create a framework that is easy to understand because there are a lot of moving parts in a business. And if you don't sort of understand how they all go together, it's easy to get lost and or overwhelmed. So the money, we've got the uh, profit model, which we covered in the first session, and cash flow we covered in the first session, uh, reporting and investing. So if you're at the stage where you, know to be, you need to be making more money, then you want to make sure you've got the profit model and cash flow sorted. If you haven't, that might be something to focus on in the next 90 days. Then we get to the more exciting stage, the, the growth. And in session number five, we went through the marketing blueprint. Right, so before we do any kind of marketing, we want to make sure we've got our marketing blueprint under control. Then we went through the six point growth model. This was session number three in compounding our profits, right? We had all those six different areas that we can work on, lead generation, conversion, average, you know, average spend per customer, margins and overhead. So that's how, that's the model we use to drive profitability. So if you're looking to do that, that might be something you look at um, in your 90 day plan. Then we've got the planning, which we're talking about today. And last one is rhythm and execution, which we're also talking about today. On the operations, we've got time, time choices and how we use our time. So we covered that in session number two. Then we've got workflow, which is going to be next week, and systems and technology. So that's how we get everything running nice and smoothly in the business. Roles and responsibilities, so making sure everyone knows what they're doing in the business. And sorry, lastly, systems and technology. Then we move to team, four points under team, we've got purpose. So we talked a little bit about, about purpose today. This is specifically talking about your business purpose. So when you're trying to engage a team, we wanna be super clear why our business exists, give someone a reason to be there. And we're gonna talk more about that on session on team, which is in two weeks. And looking at playing rules, progress, and the last one, player selection. I'm not gonna go into detail on that because we are gonna do that, as I mentioned, in, in a couple of weeks. But I find this, this model helpful just when you're thinking about your goals and what you want to achieve, you can sort of pinpoint to the area that you know you need to look at and explore more that's going to help you, help you achieve the goal. 
And then, you know, once you identify the, the key area, you can dive into the detail, which we're covering in these sessions and, and in the book, to help you think of specific strategies that you might want to put on your plan for, um, for the quarter. Now, the end game is a plan like this. So, and it, you know, it doesn't have to be like this. This is just the one we use. This is called a, a Gantt chart, fancy word. Basically, where you've got the goals you're after, the actions you're going to take and the time frames horizontally on when you're going to get things done. So, you know, like I said a while ago, it doesn't always go according to plan, but the idea of this one page plan is that you can look at one page and know, you know, get your focus pretty quickly on what you should be doing. If you've got to flip through this workbook every time to work out what you should be doing, you're probably never going to flip through the workbook. Uh, and you might get lost or get sidetracked. But when you've got a one-page plan, you can have that sitting next to your desk, you can have it on your bathroom mirror, you can have it on your steering wheel, you can have it wherever you want, right? And it just, it's in your focus, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So we've talked about goals and we've talked about strategies. So how do we break it down to be a tool that we can use? Well, on, when you look at your, so you should have, ideal, maybe we haven't done this yet, looked at our 90 day goals. So we've looked at our one year goals, where we want to be in one year. So now we want to ask ourselves, what are the milestones or the mini goals that we might want to look at for the quarter? So take a moment to do that. So take a look at your one year goal and say, okay, to be on track for that, what do we need to get done in the next quarter? What do we need to get done in the next quarter? And in your workbook, you might write this down on page 11. So these are the key strategies. Oh, sorry, we're sorry, we're talking 90 day goals. So I'm getting ahead of myself. 90 day goals. And if you've got something down for that, then on page 11, you can start to write down, okay, what might be some strategies we're gonna work on to make that goal happen? You know, if at this point, you don't know, you don't know how you should do it, well that's where you should seek some help. Or you know, most, you know, most of these areas, for most goals that you're trying to achieve in a business, there's plenty you can draw from, from the book or ask other people, like get some ideas. So you might, you know, if you had one goal for the quarter, or maybe it was a one year goal that you've got a strategy for, but you might end up with something like, you know, one or two goals with, with three, three strategies in total. So one strategy for, to achieve a goal. Like let's say you said, my goal was to grow our customer base by, by 100% over the next year. Then you might say, okay, strategy number one that we're gonna do this quarter for that is we're gonna implement a, you know, an email newsletter uh, for our database. Or it might be we're gonna implement a referral mechanism Right, that would be the strategy that's gonna help you achieve that goal. If your other goal was we wanna make $100,000 in profit, the first strategy might be to increase our margins, right? or you might get more specific on that and say we're gonna increase our pricing. And the second strategy might be that we are going to increase uh, our conversion rate by putting a guarantee in place. They might be the two things you're gonna do this quarter to help you make $100,000. So we're getting right down specific to exactly what we're going to do. Again, you can have as many or as little as you want of things you're trying to do in a quarter. I would just advise you to do less than more. You're better off to go into a quarter going, well, oh, we can get this done easy versus going into a quarter thinking, oh my God, because you'll be all excited at the start and then it'll kick in how much work you've got to do and you'll, you'll lose the mojo. But if it's nice and easy to get done, I'm not saying easy as in not difficult, but easy as in time-wise to get done, then you're setting yourself up for success. And sometimes that can be even more important than doing lots of stuff. Like if you get a, a rhythm and a momentum around being successful and executing your 90-day plans, you'll get better, your belief changes around your ability to get them done. And then you can start making them harder and more complex. So, or another way to look at this is you could plan it out for a year. You know, if you want to say, okay, we are going to just focus on this 90 day plan, but I want to be able to see, you know, what we're going to do. And we do this with clients sometimes when we know there's a one year goal we want to go after, and we know there's going to be lots of things to do, but we know we're not going to get it all done in a quarter. We'll map out the year just broadly. 
you know, we'll do one quarter quite specifically, but we'll think, okay, we'll probably do this one in second quarter two, we'll do this and this in quarter three, and then we'll leave these last three to the last quarter. And so we can just sort of map it out. So we've got a sort of a rough time, you know, sorry, <laughs> like that. We've got a rough picture of how it's all gonna flow for the year. And then you can have your year kind of mapped out. It might change when you get to the next quarter, but it just helps give you context. You know, different people like to do it in different ways. So what I'd like you to do, has everyone got a strategy down to, that can, is gonna help them or possibly help them to achieve their 90 day goal? Because what we're gonna to move to is this next page, 12 and 13. So there's a couple of examples here for you on a detailed page of a strategy. So if you take a look at page 12, what was the goal? The goal was to achieve 30K, 30,000 net profit by the end of the 90 day period. And the strategy was to hire two new sales reps by the end of February. So you can see then there's a, a measure of success. So we know when we've done it well, so we haven't just got the people hired, but they're actually generating some revenue. And down below, there's a whole list of actions that need to happen. Now, depending on your behavioral style, you might look at this and have a bit of a brain hemorrhage, but I can tell you it's, uh, it's valuable to do this exercise. And it's valuable because it forces you to unpack what needs to be done. And I mentioned before, one of the reasons why we don't do things is because we're not clear. Sometimes we think we're clear. We think, oh, yeah, I just got to do that. I just got to hire a couple of people. I can do that. But then when you go to do it, and if it's not clear in your mind, you'll go to something that is clear in your mind and you'll go to something you're comfortable with. And so you'll, you'll just, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Because it's, you don't realize it sometimes, but it's too hard in your mind to break down. So you're doing the hard work now and you're breaking down the steps. So you can uncover if there's any stuff you don't know how to do or where you're going to need help or where it's going to cost more than what you might think or where you don't know how much it's going to cost. You do that work now, not halfway through your 90 day plan when you're behind schedule by a month. So there's three columns to, to map out here. There's the, oh, sorry, five columns. There's the, the steps. Uh, there's the date by when you're going to get it done. There's the who's going to do it. That's an important column. Don't just put down everyone or no one. Someone's got to be accountable for the step. The cost and I think the amount of time is critical to put down there. It helps you get come to grips with how long stuff's going to take. Because back to our time choices session on the second week, when you're planning your week, you're going to be looking at your 90 day plan and saying, okay, what have I got to make room for this week to get done? And if you've done the work on how long it's going to take, then you're starting from a point of knowing or at least having an increased level of awareness versus just trying to squeeze it in somewhere. Sometimes we're optimistic on how long things take. And so, you know, they become too hard. What we're trying to do here is to make it not hard, to make it not hard. So what I'd like you to do is a blank page on page 14, 15, a couple of different ones. Just have a go. I mean, maybe it's easy, the one you've picked. Maybe there's only two things you've got to write down, but maybe there's more to one pack. Write it down to a level of detail where you can look at that and go, I know exactly what I have to do. Sometimes you've got to think through the follow-up action too, like it's all part of the strategy. Like if your strategy was to increase prices by 5%, you might say, well, that's easy. I just change the number on the computer, it's done. But maybe the follow-up action is check if it affects your conversion rate or you know, check on feedback from customers or something to make sure the, the strategy is successful. So if you, if you have the thought at all that taking half a day or a full day feels too luxurious, um, I'm giving you permission. It's okay, you can take that day. 100% it's yours, right? I, you have permission to take that day. I have a client, Jacinda, she runs an event company. She hires a hotel room. You know, she's got young kids. So she like, hires a hotel room, goes and stays overnight somewhere and spends the rest of the day, next day uh, working, working on a business once a quarter. Um, yeah, yeah, I can't stress enough how important it is to get out of your business. Like don't sit at your desk and do this. 
go somewhere where you're in a different environment because it'll affect your thinking. You'll just think differently, you'll be freer. Um, so you might, might know that where that place is or maybe you've got to experiment, but um, yeah, it's, it's not an at the desk exercise. Now there's, you know, once you've, once you've got your strategies picked out and you've done all that detail work, then you sort of got to work out, okay, what's the best way for me to get that onto one page? And I shared the, the format with you that, that we often use, but you don't have to use that. You can use whatever you want. On um, page 19, I guess it is, is a, a little bit of a different format. Still got the, the time frame there, but it's got a few other bits and pieces there too. It's got uh, you know area for the critical drivers. If there are some key measurements you're measuring for the quarter, you throw them up there. It's got room for the longer term goals there to keep you reminded on the, the long term vision. And the one that I like on this one is the growing your knowledge or you know growing your the habits you want to work on. I think that's a really really important part. Be sure to include that so it's not not on that one. It's on in your workbook there. Be sure to include the things that you want to become better at for the quarter and try and make it aligned with the things that you're trying to, the strategy you're trying to do. If you're doing a financial thing, read a book on finances that quarter. Or if you're doing a marketing thing, read a book on marketing that quarter. So you're continually growing your skills. Okay. And that's the way it works. So you might not, like if you've got, say, 20 things on your detail page, you may not be able to get them all on a one pager. You know, it might make it too crowded. You want your one page to be pleasant to look at and easy to understand. So maybe just pick out the key things. Like maybe there's five major things that you know you gotta do. So, you know, make it so you can see it. Now, you've, let's say you've got a one page plan like this. You're all excited, you've spent the day at the hotel, a couple of glasses of wine, you go, this is great, I'm focused, I've got a clear plan, let's go do it. You get back home, what happens? What's that? Husband laughs at you, right? You've got, you get back to the office, what happens? You stay focused and you execute with consistency. Your team's all on board. They're like, yes, we'll get, we can do this. And it just flows smoothly right through the quarter and all runs perfectly. No? Oh, that's how it works in my business. No, so it doesn't always work that way, does it? So this is the, the getting shit done part. And I'll give you five things. So. Number one is the clarity, and we've just done that, like getting super clear. Like that's why we do the, the detail. I know it can feel tedious to do, but the detail and the visioning stuff, like the big picture dreaming, all that forms a picture that can help you get super clear on where you're going and why you're doing it and exactly what you gotta do. So that's number one. Number two, I wasn't joking about on the bathroom mirror and on the steering wheel and wherever else you want it to be, but you gotta keep that plan where you can see it. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. And you'd be amazed at what happens when you've got that plan just sitting next to wherever you work the most and you're finding yourself procrastinating or getting off track or so, you know, distracted in some way, shape or form. It's a little reminder for you that, uh, of what, what, what you should be focused on and why, why you're doing it. Number three is meeting rhythms. And I'm going to expand on this one. Um, meetings have a bad rap. Like whenever you say the word meetings, most people get a little bit of a, a skin crawl. And that, you know, sometimes that's for good reason because there's a lot of meeting meetings that aren't run well and meetings can be a waste of time. But meetings are also a critical part of getting stuff done. Even if you don't have a team, meetings are still important. And I'll, I'll share you, I'm gonna share a rhythm with you around that. It brings you back, it gets you centered around what's important. Measurement. So knowing what's working and what's not, um, if you have ever tried and had the goal of losing weight and never measured yourself, you know, it normally doesn't go too well, right? If you got a, a, if you're an athlete and you want to get a certain time that you want to run to, but you never measure your time, you know, how do you know if you're on track or not? So we need a way to know if we're, if we're on track. And number five, the magic word accountability, which normally is most problematic for business owners, not their, not their team. But anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So let's start with the meeting rhythm. So four types of meetings you might want to think about. And if you're not doing any meetings right now, don't start with all four. You want to start small on this. But so strategic, which is really talking about the stuff you just put on your plan. Operational, which is the everyday business type of stuff. Marketing and finance. So there are four types of meetings and you might put them, you might combine some of them to have them in the same meeting. But I find it's important to have most, or a lot of people have operational meetings already to some degree, 
but you usually don't do the other three. And the reason it's important is because it brings focus. So you're bringing together whoever's important to make sure these things are getting done. Are you bringing that, and if, even if it's only you, you're sitting down saying, right now I'm having the strategic meeting and here's what you're gonna, here's what you're gonna talk about. You put a mirror up and you talk to yourself. <laughs> Who is it? Okay, it's you or whoever's accountable for getting things done on the plan is who should be at the meeting. When? Well, I say twice a month because I think you need one at the end of the month to set you for the next month and you want one midway through the month to see how you're going. At, at the minimum, if it needs to be more frequently, you'll know whether you'll know what you need. Basically, it's that again, it's the intentional time where you're you're pulling out your 90-day plan, and you're looking at how you're going. Are we on track? Where are we stuck? Where do we need help? What's coming up? Do we know what we got to do? Do we have everything we need? Are there any problems? Right. And lastly, big picture: has anything changed that would affect our plan that we should be considering? So it's just an intentional moment where you sit down and do these things. It doesn't have to be long. It can be literally, yeah, you know, it could be a 10 minute meeting. It doesn't have to be longer. It might be in a one hour meeting, depending on the complexity and what you've got to talk through. But it's something that should be in your calendar and you make it recurring. So if you're doing twice a month, it's gonna be on the second Tuesday and the last Tuesday of the month. Put it in your calendar, set it for recurring, invite the people that should be there and that's what you do. So strategic, operational. Actually, I'm just gonna come back here. If I was gonna pick one, if you're not doing any meetings right now, I would start with strategic. I think that's a good one to start with because it centers around what I think is some of the most important aspects of the business. And often people will combine the finance meeting with the strategic meeting. Those two are often combined. Operational, this is your general day-to-day -day business type stuff. So who gets involved with that? Well, usually everyone to some degree, uh, whoever needs to know what's going on. So the reason operational meetings are important, and again, these ones should be short. Um, and I'm a big fan of standing meetings. Like don't sit down, like stay standing, huddle around a table or something. But if you sit down, you get comfortable. Never book an hour for a meeting because then it takes an hour. Like make it, make it a 15 minute meeting in the calendar and you're, you're off to a good start. But the reason it's good is because quite often people are moving in different directions or doing different things, or even you yourself, you've got lots on your plate. And it's just that moment of sitting down and getting clear around, well, what we're gonna do is key priorities for the day, reviewing schedules are major things that have to happen that day, and does anyone need help? So it's basically a chance just to get clear on what's gotta happen for the day. And it depends on the business. I've got a client that runs a printing business and so they do, a, they do a daily huddle in the morning just to make sure, okay, these are the jobs that are going to go on the presses today, these are the jobs that are going out today, at least that's our plan. And they have another one just after lunch. What's changed? Oh, this client now needs this. Oh, they don't need that today now. Can we swap that one around? And a lot of this, you think, well, we can do that via email too or via Slack or one of, the, of these systems and, and you, you possibly can. But I think there's, it can be a danger in that too because using technology for communication all the time and studies are coming out on how much people use technology for communication it can be very um, fracturing to your time uh, and if we're always looking at our devices and checking messages and checking this and that our mind is scattered if you know that we've got a meeting every morning or we've got a meeting twice a day then you can save things to that moment and often you can be in a room, if you've got multiple people in your business, you can solve things so much faster with the right people there. You can get it done in one conversation versus an email chain or a Slack conversation that requires clarification and did someone read it, someone else didn't read it. So knowing how to use meetings is, is really important. I'm reading a book at the moment, it's fascinating, called uh, A World Without Email. And they did a study with knowledge workers and they worked out that on average, on average, knowledge workers, people that work on a computer, they check email every six minutes. And that includes time that they take out to be focused on things and time for lunch. It includes all that on an average every six minutes. Crazy. And that just kills our focus, absolutely kills our focus. So that's operational. Um, oh, last point. Yeah, if big topics come up in the operational meeting, you take them offline. So, you know, sometimes you've got a meeting with three or four people and someone starts to get in the weeds on a topic, but only, you know, involves one other person. Then you say, okay, you guys take that, solve that outside of this meeting. Let's not get bogged down on that. 
So these are not generally not intended to be deep detail meetings. They're just a chance to clean up communication and make sure we're clear on the day. Marketing, uh, who does that? So whoever's involved in execution of the marketing. So if you've got yeah, someone who you've outsourced stuff to, bring them into that meeting. When, monthly or twice monthly, usually monthly is okay, unless you need to check on your results more often. But what are you doing? Checking your results, reviewing what's un upcoming. So what's the marketing plan for the next one to three months? In our session, oh, the fifth session, I talked about a marketing activity calendar, which is kind of like a 90 day plan for your marketing. And the goal is to always have a rolling six month calendar. So you'll start at the beginning of a quarter, you'll see what's happening for the next six months. At the end of that quarter, you plan for the next three months, like the three months up ahead. So you start again with a six month plan in front of you. And that way, you know, if you've got content to write or you've got to do something, you've got some forewarning on what you need to do. And again, same thing, big picture. Has anything changed? We need, need to change our, our plan here in any way, shape or form. So once again, this is like doing a marketing meeting. It's something you could do on the fly, but taking that dedicated time to sit down, and again, it doesn't have to be long. It could just be 15 minutes, but it's just a chance to recenter, be 100% focused on the marketing, not just do it as you're doing 100 other things as well. You probably see the, the key to these is quick, quick and simple, uh, just making sure that we're, we're checking in on the important things to keep keep the proactive parts of the business running. Otherwise they get hidden. Because all this, like the strategic and the marketing and even the finance sometimes are seen as you know, afterthoughts in running a business and they get pushed to the side and just something we've got to do sort of in between things. What I'm suggesting is let's bring it to the forefront and make it like dedic invest the time and make it dedicated time. So then we're, we're declaring how important this stuff is in growing our business. Finance, who's in this one? Well, anyone who is accountable for a line on the profit and loss or a line on the balance sheet. And when I say that, you might have people who are more focused on sales. Well, they probably should be there. I'm a huge fan of open book management in your business. Um, and I think the more you can share financial data with the people in your business, the more powerful it is because they are informed and they, their behavior will change when they understand the scorecard. Most people don't share financial information with the team. And so the team's sort of always in the dark. And they're usually the perception the owner's making millions, um, which is rarely the case. And so we, there are ways, I mean, it's a topic way bigger than we've got time to go into now, but there are ways to be open book with your team that are hugely beneficial and profit sharing. So when minimum monthly, I like twice a month as well. Like at the end of the month or the beginning of the month, you're reviewing results from the pre previous month but the middle of the month, you're checking in to see how we're going. Particularly if you are a sales driven business, like you wanna make sure you're on track for your sales. If you are a hugely driven sales um, business, then you, you want sales meetings in there as well. And sales meetings probably should happen once a day, at least a daily huddle. That's probably the operational element for a sales team. Always checking in with a daily scorecard on where we're at. What did we cover in the finance meeting? Straightforward. Right, the, the results, where are we at? What's our profit first budget look like? What's coming up? Are there any cash flow issues we've got to look at? Any big expenses we've got to be aware of? Um, our sales forecast, and then again, the big picture view. You know, is there anything that we've got to be thinking about? Any capital needs that we've got to be thinking about down the track? You may not talk about that every time, but you, you know, certainly at a quarterly meeting, you want to be talking about that. So, if you don't do any of this now, that's completely okay. But maybe there's one of these that you look at and go, you know what, we could probably benefit by starting with that one. And when you start, you just start small, start really small and simple, but develop the, the habit around it and you will hopefully see the benefit of it and then you can start to expand it and do more and more. And if you're a super small company, you might roll all these up into one meeting, just make sure you've got time allocated for each one. It's not like one big mass agenda that you're trying to get through everything. You want to carve out a little bit of time, bring focus to each thing. Now, accountability. Why don't people do what they say they're going to do? No, one here. you guys have trouble with accountability? No, no problem. <laughs> like I say, normally it's the business owner that's um, the biggest problem. But sometimes it is people on the team as well. 
And so having a bit of an idea on, on how to make this happen is good because the word accountability normally doesn't bring up comfortable thoughts. It normally feels like, ah, oh, this is going to be awkward. Why don't we have to do this kind of stuff? Probably the first point here, and I haven't got it on the slide here, is the business owner. Like often, and I give my clients a hard time around this, like if they're not doing the right thing, they can't expect their team to do it. I've got a brand new client, Mark. He's got a big business. He's got a $12 million business. He's got three other businesses on the side. And there's one startup he's been focused on for the last 12 months. And he kind of hasn't really been paying attention to the main business. And it's not going well. And then when I asked him about what's going on, and he said, well, the team's not doing this, not doing that. And then I asked him, well, what are your actions? What's your behavior as the leader of this team? And he's not doing it either. So he hasn't got any right to be complaining around what's the team doing if he's not congruent in his own actions as a leader. So the starting point with the accountability is to be accountable ourselves, right? And that's, that can be hard when you're a business owner because sometimes you don't really have any point of accountability. Like if it doesn't get done, well, I'm the one that suffers, so who cares? But that's dangerous when you've got a team, very dangerous. So people don't do things because they often don't know how to do them, right? If they haven't got the skills to do something, um, and maybe they don't know they haven't got the skills, but again, it falls into that trap of, yeah, I'll do that for you. But in their mind, it's not clear or it's harder in their mind. There's easier things for them to go and do. So they procrastinate and go and do the easier things. So making sure they've got the skills or maybe it's time management, right? They don't know how to organize themselves. So that's a skill issue. It's not necessarily a, a effort issue. Then we've got the don't understand the task. And this happens, I see this a lot, right? It's sort of, you ask someone to do something verbally on the fly, you know, it's sort of discuss, you think you've explained it well, but you haven't really explained it well. That's sort of getting clear on the, on the expectations of the task. Or don't see the importance of the task, right? You might ask someone to do something, but they kind of take it as, well, that sounds like it's a nice to do. And not, they might not intentionally not do it, but they're just other things they think are more important to do, so they, they don't do it. So it's important, I think, to just reflect on these because I see often we want to look to the people as being the problem when often the problem is actually in our own communication, how we set people up and how we delegate things to people. So let's take a look. The fourth one is they just don't care. But I think this is the minority of cases, right? If this is truly the reason why someone's not doing something, then they probably shouldn't be on your team, right? And we're going to talk more about that. Not too much more about that, but um, on session eight, it might be a recruiting problem more than anything else. So how do you hold people accountable? There's three things I'm gonna share with you. Number one is the relationship. If someone doesn't have respect for you, it doesn't matter what you say to them, they're probably, they're probably not gonna perform. You might get some short-term changes in performance just through a bit of pressure, but long-term, you're not gonna get any change in performance because they, they don't care because they think that you don't care about them. So, I mean, you don't have to be best friends. You don't have to be, you know, they think you're the greatest thing in the world, but there's gotta be mutual respect. That's gotta be the first thing. If there's mutual respect, then the next one, and I, honestly, this is usually the number one thing why things go wrong, is the clear expectations. Like you just wanna be super clear. And a good way to check on this is just get people to replay it back to you. And it, you can even use, you know, self-defeating language like, look, I'm normally really crap at giving instructions. Would you mind just playing it back for me so I can be sure that I've communicated it right? right? And then you'll get an understanding of what they understand. And if they don't replay it back, you can say, sorry, I didn't, maybe I didn't communicate about this. Can we just talk about that again? Whatever needs to happen, or sometimes writing things down is a good idea. Um, we talked in the sales session about some people are visual, some are audio, and some are kinesthetic. Right? If you remember, 40, uh, sorry, 20% of the population are audible. And most instructions that we give to people are audible, but only 20% of people, that's their dominant way of taking in information. So sometimes we've got to, we've got to write it down for people. As a client we worked with, it was a production line and this guy on there, he was making mistakes left, right and centre and he'd been told over and over and over how to do the job. Well, when they understood this concept, they drew a picture and a diagram of the things that he had to do and all of a sudden he got it and his error rate went down dramatically. So that wasn't so much expectations, but just understanding the communication uh, method. And the last one is accountability is really about coaching because if we come back to the reasons why people don't do something, 
let's go back to that. The first three are, are usually more coaching issues, right? And coaching is about asking questions and understanding what's going on for someone. It doesn't have to be a long, elaborate process, but doing a bit of inquiry rather than just assuming the person's incompetent or just, you know, doesn't care. A little bit of inquiry can uncover some obstacles. So that, that can be a better way. Um, but you'll probably find that number two is, is the biggest problem. The feed forward, I, I won't go into details now. We're going to cover that a lot more in session eight. That is around how to give more formal feedback to people. Because obviously, if you're getting a repeat issue with someone not doing something, it needs to be addressed more formally. And that the feed forward system is, is a way we do that. But you'll find that if you do, if you set the clear expectations and you've got the meeting rhythm, then you can uncover most accountability issues with that, the, either the skill or the lack of clarity that comes from people. Um, that's certainly been our experience. The last one is sometimes people do need a bit of pressure. Um, they do need to, you know, they, they might be tr think they're trying really hard, but you need to be not nice. And what I mean by that, that's not the right word, but the word nice stands for when we're not willing to be candid and speak truth to someone we're allowing them to keep their standards down here. As business owners, one of our biggest jobs, I'm going to talk more about this in session eight, is to keep the standards up here. And sometimes that requires some pressure and some, some honest communication. It's done from a place of respect. It's not, hey, you're a piece of crap and here's what you need to know, right? We don't do it that way. But when we speak honestly to someone um, and be very candid with them, it, puts, it can put pressure on them. And people can be very uncomfortable with putting pressure on people. But back to the point I said before about um, law of perturbation, something's either growing or dying. And for something to grow it requires time and pressure. So sometimes it's up to us to apply the pressure. And knowing that when we do that in the right way, with respect, we're actually doing the person a favor. Because if they raise their standards, they're going to become better. They're going to get better performance, better outcomes. They're going to be happier and everyone wins. So sometimes that, that is required. All right. Wrapping it up, six things we can take away to work on. Number one is increasing our clarity of our vision and purpose. So that's the big picture. That's the, the what and the why we're trying to create, like the, the longer term. Obviously, the, the setting the goals and following the nine, the nine rules or guidelines for SMART goals. Our nine day, work, nine day plan. So you've got the workbook there and the workbook's downloadable underneath this video on the website. Developing a meeting structure setting clear expectations, and then sometimes we've got to come back and revisit our own personal habits around time, which is we covered in session number two. So, you know, if you still haven't got mastery over your own use of time, then some of this stuff goes out the window. So we've still got to come back and use some of those principles as well. You're ready to go and conquer the world, create amazing businesses and change the world, impact a billion people, hold people uncomfortably accountable. Awesome. All right. Thanks for coming out, everyone.